So next up is, a, uh, is an update on the research project titled Genomics Research to Elucidate the Genetics of Rare Disease, or Gregor. And Jennifer Posey is a assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine. She's also one of the grantees in the consortium and the committee co-chair. And she's here to give the update for Gregor. All right, so first of all, thank you. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be in the room today with, with all of you. And thank you for inviting me here and for being so welcoming, um, as this is the first time I've, I've attended council. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and jump right into it and start by saying that we know that gene discovery has had a tremendous impact on molecular diagnostic rates. And it's really helped inform mechanisms underlying all disease, and I would argue both rare and in some instances even common disease, pediatric and adult disease, prenatal as well. Despite that, we know that a substantial pr proportion of rare disease families remain without a molecular diagnosis, and this is a problem. So the question that we're trying to ask or trying to address is how do we get from the scenario on the left side of the screen to the scenario on the right side of the screen where we no longer have rare disease families who don't have a molecular diagnosis or who have perhaps a candidate variant or gene um, but with a, a variety, of, a certain amount of uncertainty, how do we get all of these families to a molecular diagnosis? And we believe that to do this, there are several current gaps in the field that need to be addressed. One is understanding and identifying the etiologic gene or variant of many Mendelian conditions. Speaking a lot to what uh, you just heard in the previous talk, we also know that variant functional impacts are critical to understand. And I'll show you an example in a little while of um, one particular gene where distinct variants can have very different functional impacts and very different phenotypic impacts on our rare disease families, and we have to understand the molecular mechanisms underlying this. We also need to better understand the diagnostic utility of newer genomic technologies, which ones should we be implementing clinically, for example. Along those lines also, the utility of newer reference builds. When and how and which ones do we implement in our clinical labs and in our clinics? And we also need to really identify and generate a comprehensive understanding of the molecular mechanisms underlying disease, including um, adult disease as well. So I'm here representing the Gregor Consortium, Genomic Research to Elucidate the Genetics of Rare Disease. We have five research centers, which I'm showing you in the top left, as well as a data coordinating center. But what I want to really um, address right off the bat is that our reach extends far beyond that map that you see in the top left. We are very motivated to engage in global recruitment, and we're very motivated to address some of the disparities that we see in the field and that you've heard about today. Um, to that end, several different approaches at several different levels. Our centers are using foreign language consents, We've developed workflows for remote enrollment, remote collection, so that rare disease families don't have to travel to our sites to become participants in these programs. We've implemented this research in clinics for uninsured and underinsured um, families. We've also begun to focus in several ways on variant functional studies that reduce VUS disparity between white and non-white populations, and I'll show you just a little bit of those data and of course, worldwide participant engagement. In the map on the lower left, I'm focusing just on global recruitment and just on global recruitment during the actual years of Gregor. So this doesn't include data from some of the programs that many of our sites previously engaged in, like the UDN and the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. And that's important to note that our data actually spans even beyond what you see on that slide. It also is not representative of the many collaborators that we work with um, at at other, in other countries who may not have directly sent us patients, but with whom we've shared really important discoveries. Next, I wanted to also highlight, continuing that theme of how our reach expands beyond the map that I just showed you, um, we have several different collaborators, grantees, and fundees. And the left side, the Deborah Nickerson Memorial Diversity Award grantees. 
These are grantees who've received either educational awards through the Gregor program or professional development awards. And I won't read their names in the interest of time. We also have an opportunity fund program to support individual research projects from individuals who are outside of the core Gregor consortium. They actually join our consortium as opportunity fundees and they bring um, unique techniques, unique approaches, unique knowledge and expertise to help answer some of the questions that we're trying to answer for our rare disease communities. And then finally in the bottom right, you see that we also have a mechanism to bring in um, partner members. So anybody can apply to become a partner member um, and those applications are reviewed and you can see that there are several partner members already at this stage. Thinking about some of the conversations earlier today and how important it is to support early career investigators, I think all of our sites have had a tremendous focus on that, although it's not um, sort of a clearly stated goal within the consortium. And I wanted to share with you several of the trainees and now former trainees who've successfully navigated career development awards, who've become promoted to faculty, or who have entered additional postdoctoral training programs in a variety of levels. Now the mission. Our mission is to significantly increase the proportion of Mendelian conditions with an identified genetic cause. This is no small mission, but we think it's absolutely important. Three of our goals that speak to this are the three that I'm gonna focus on today, and they're what you see here create a data set with broad utility, increase diagnostic yield, and develop genomics practice recommendations. And I'll take you through each of these in a couple of moments. I also want to highlight that Gregor expertise cuts across many disciplines at each of our centers, at all of our centers as a whole. So I won't read these disciplines out to you, but I want to highlight that Gregor is not limited to a specific rare disease or a small number of rare disease conditions. The consortium and this infrastructure that we have supports efficiency in discovery and dissemination, allowing for broader impact. It enables development of recommendations for improving molecular diagnostic rates in research and clinical labs. And importantly, it provides a really rich learning environment for the many trainees who are supported by the consortium. So I'll move on to our goals and I'll take each one of these one by one and provide you a bit of an update. Um, first, creating a data set with broad utility. So data sharing um, is really first and foremost in everything that Gregor does. And perhaps most critically, we share individual level genomic, phenotypic, and pedigree data in Anvil. I'll show you a bit more about our data model in a moment. Um, participants are broadly consented and in addition to that, we also now have an open access genomic summary results table, which I'll also show you on the consortium website, so that an individual who wants to understand what data might be in, in our um, Gregor Anvil data set does not first have to apply to, to um, dbGaP for access before they can at least get a bit of an overview of what's in our data set. We also engage in two-sided gene or variant matching through the matchmaker exchange. And we also submit um, gene and variant disease relationships to publicly searchable uh, databases such as ClinVar and GenCC. So this is um, very, very early days in um, our genome and gene browser, but I wanted to share this with you because it's open access and we think that this is absolutely critical. This is a beta version. Actually, this just became available to me a few days ago. We are still in the process of adding additional annotations, but I wanted to show you that, for, for example, here you see in this search bar, I don't know if you can see my, you, you probably can't see my mouse. Um, I've entered ATAD3A, and then at the bottom you have a data table that shows you the different variants in that gene, how many occurrences there are and the zygosity of those occurrences within the data set. So you could, as an external investigator, before even attempting to access our data in Anvil, ask, do you even have the variant of interest that I'm looking to study further? So our data model is also really, really critical to a lot of the things that we do. It's based on, um, it's a, it's a multi-level data model with multiple relationships represented within this. 
family structure is captured as well as individual participants, those participants might submit more than one analyte. They may have more than one phenotype, and they could have one or more genetic findings, which may be putative molecular diagnoses or candidate diagnoses for each family. Each of those genetic findings is linked to one or more experiments, and thinking about the different genome references we've heard about today, one or more alignments of those experiments. This data model, it supports cataloging of candidate genes and variants. It supports application and integration of multiple technologies needed to comprehensively access a wider range of haplotype resolved genomic variants. And it allows development and refinement of methods for variant analysis interpretation. This is scalable. It is usable across all of our Gregor sites. It's usable externally. It supports standardization and harmonization of our data. And we have released our first joint call set now for short read data. Aspects of this data model are being begun, beginning to be adopted by other consortia, which speaks to its utility. And I want to highlight that Seeker has been implemented in Anvil, and it's able to read and access the Gregor data model so that individuals can take the joint call set and analyze those data within the Seeker interface. So the Gregor data set is growing. We're nowhere near um, completion of what we would like to achieve. As a reminder, participants, they consent for broad research use. Right now, we're engaging in staggered biannual uploads by research centers so that every three months, half of the research centers are uploading their most recent six months of data. Um, data are uploaded um, as, as soon as they're generated, but every six months. Um, there is iterative joint calling across the short read data that's been released. And importantly for several of our missions, in, in particular understanding the utility of some of the different technologies that we're investigating, we're beginning to see an increasing number of families for whom more than one technology is applied. And you can see some of that reflected in the Venn diagram to the right showing you short read technologies, RNA-seq, and also long read technologies. And the table at the bottom left shows you a quick overview of the number of participants, families, and technologies that are represented within the data set right now. So I want to move on and talk a little bit about increasing the diagnostic yield. And this cuts across many areas. So this part of the talk may feel a little bit disjointed, but I wanted to give you the full flavor of the different activities that are ongoing within Gregor. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, our goal is to increase the molecular diagnostic rates for all rare disease families. And so with that in mind, one of the first collaborative manuscripts that we developed was really a brainstorm of pathways to get to a molecular diagnosis for families when exome sequencing is negative or non-diagnostic. The goal here was to provide, particularly for non-genetics specialists, even some genetic specialists, the rate of technology, the rate of change, the rate of tools happens so quickly now. It's hard to keep up. We wanted to provide a framework for thinking about next steps when you're faced with a family that has a negative exome sequence. And so I won't belabor the details here, but this is essentially the framework that we started with. Now, I should highlight this was one of our early papers. The goal would be that at the end of Gregor, many, many years from now, that, <laughs> that we'll be able to come back to this and say, now we have concrete data to tell you for a particular case, a particular disease characteristic, a particular family structure, a particular scenario with a particular variant, what is the closest, the shortest path from A to B for that particular family. So this is an overall brainstorm, but I think that this can be far, far refined and it can be done by our consortium. We've also explored the utility of genome sequencing in the context that up until recently and perhaps to some extent even now, a lot of the broad clinical testing that happens at a clinical level is really exome sequencing. So what does genome sequencing buy you? In this particular study, genome sequencing enabled an overall diagnostic rate of 29.3%, so 218 cases. And you can see that in the pie chart here in blue. Of those solved cases, 
148 had a prior non-diagnostic exome sequence, and that's shown here now in gold. So those were individuals that we could go back and ask, what was missed in the exome sequence? Should it have been missed? And why was it found in the genome sequencing? And this bar graph that you see to the right shows exactly that. So the dark blue components of these bars show you the variance, the 28% of variance in those 148 solved cases that required genome sequencing to be detected. They were structural variants, coding variants that had poor coverage in exome sequencing, and tandem repeat expansions. We've also looked at the impact of genome build on RNA sequencing interpretation. In this particular study, we started with 316 participants. They had a variety of different um, tissue sources for their RNA. They underwent RNA sequencing, and then the sequencing data were aligned to 1938 and T to T, or CHM13. And the question was, how, how do these different alignments influence expression and outlier detection? This study identified 2,800 genes that had build-dependent quantification, including 314 rare disease genes. Multiple of these genes had detectable expression only in a subset of genome builds. We have a lot more to answer here, but this is giving us very early clues about how important it is to consider which genome builds we're using with certain technologies and under what circumstances. We've also been investigating the utility of transcriptomics hand in hand with long read sequencing to interpret structural variants. So what I'm showing you here is a study of 68 undiagnosed individuals. Each one of them had called from their long read sequencing data about 716 structural variants on average. Those regions were then assessed for gene expression. And it turned out that rare structural variants that overlapped enhancers, as well as tandem repeats, were enriched near expression outliers. This work led to the development of a new tool called Watershed SV to prioritize high confidence structural variants using this approach. Thinking even more deeply about our long read data, one of the huge challenges in the field is that we don't have large control data sets from long read sequencing. So as part of the Thousand Genomes Project long read initiatives, we have now data from the first 100 samples, which I'm, which I'm showing you here. These are structural variant calls. They were benchmarked against the HPRC Sniffles 2 SV call set. Um, you can see the benchmarking in panel A, and what's, what's very important to us is in panel B across the different structural variant callers you see a fairly consistent number of, S, of structural variants called per sample. All five members of the superpopulation were represented here, as well as about 19 different subpopulations within this data set. Digging more deeply into the data, we see when we look at insertion and deletions um, and um, graph their counts by size. You can see a peak at 300 base pairs for both the deletions and insertions consistent with um, ALU insertions and deletions. We also see in panel D that cumul cumulative unique structural variants um, increase per sample, but that there's an absolute difference in the number of those that you see in individuals of African descent compared to non-African descent. It goes without saying that as we start to talk about these different technologies, something that's absolutely critical is to have the tools needed to analyze these data. And I'm showing you a very, very small snippet of what's been developed in Gregor. These tools are being um, applied to our joint call sets. They're being implemented in Anvil as much as possible and being made as available as possible through GitHub and um, other mechanisms so that other researchers could implement them locally if they desired. So here I'm showing you HMZ dupe finder in the top left. This is a tool that enables small exonic duplications that are homozygous, and it's very helpful when studying families where there's a high degree of parental consanguinity and identity by descent. In the top right, VizCNV is a tool that allows you to visualize allelic imbalances 
using phased data. So you can use trio, um, trio data to look at these and you can identify for a given copy number variant whether it was inherited from the maternal genome or the paternal genome. Methylation operation wizard, or MEOW, um, supports identification of differentially methylated regions for long, from long read sequencing. And then we also have here a tandem repeat browser, which um, is essentially a, a browser of tandem repeats generated from those first 100 um, long read uh, control data that I mentioned a moment ago. So thinking a little bit more just from a rare disease perspective, something that I think is, is very, very important to the work that we do is understanding how not only individual genes influence disease expression, but how individual variants influence disease expression. And I had a cornucopia of examples I could have shown you today. I'm only gonna show you one in the interest of time. Um, FLVCR1, variants in this gene were previously associated with adult onset retinitis pigmentosa as well as childhood onset ataxia and retinitis pigmentosa. Families enrolled in Greger, however, were found to have rare damaging variants in this gene associated with distinct phenotypes, severe neurodevelopmental delay with premature death, and multiple congenital anomalies, hydranencephaly and stillbirth, so much more severe phenotypes. It turned out that when we looked at these individuals and their variants, and performed functional assays. So in this case, this gene encodes a choline transporter. We could measure choline transport. We could work with Kinga Bujakowska, who's one of our opportunity fundies to look at impacts on splicing using her mini gene splicing assay. And then we could also look at mouse models and really begin to understand that increasingly severe variants that perturbed this protein's function resulted in increasingly severe human phenotypes. There are a lot of other components related to molecular mechanisms of disease that I won't have time to go into into detail today, but that are absolutely critical for, for solving unsolved cases and, and getting families molecular diagnoses. We need to continue to understand the role of multi-locus pathogenic variation in human disease. We're increasingly also identifying non-coding RNA variants, like the link RNA chaser, and there's a recent story of RNA42 which many of you may have heard presented at various meetings. This was in, um, initiated by an investigator external to Gregor. However, she reached out to several Gregor um, PIs. We were able to use our joint call set to identify very rapidly several additional cases with rare variants in this non-coding RNA. And those are part of the initial paper that will eventually come out. We also need to be tackling aberrant methylation and defining epi-signatures in rare disease, CHD2. It's a great example of that. And we have a lovely example of a non-coding STR variant that influences the distance between two enhancers and leads to overexpression of a nearby microRNA. We have a lot of genes and variants that are candidate diagnoses for many of our cases. And I wanted to highlight for you that one of, our, one of our activities has been related to identifying functional investigators who can help us get from a VUS or a GUS to a pathogenic or benign, um, a disease gene or not a disease gene. And so I'll just show you here kind of by way of summary some of the work that our variant to functional functionalization working group has been doing pairing um, pairing uh, unclear variants and genes with relevant investigators, both within and outside of the Gregor Consortium. Along those lines, we have several cross-consortium partnerships of which you heard of from IGBF just a little while ago. We've been working closely with them to nominate candidate genes and variants for several of the, the functional studies that they're working with, and I've shown you here on the left particular partnerships with IGVF Varchamp, which is the variant characterization across the Mendelian Proteome Center, as well as IGVF CABA, the Center for Actionable Variant Analysis, and then IGVF PerturbSeq. Why is this important? I think the, the earlier talk touched upon, upon this a little bit. When we look at, when we look at 
the VUS across populations, it's very clear that non-white individuals have a higher proportion of VUS than white individuals. And if you look at the orange and blue bar graphs here, you can see that on the left side of that bar graph with the non-Europeans represented in blue and the Europeans in um, orange. We now know, um, looking at a few specific genes in collaboration with um, other, other consortia, that we can apply multiplexed assays of variant effects to resolve those VUS into pathogenic or benign. And when we do that, not only do we reduce the number of VUS that we're dealing with for the genes that have been studied, but we reduce that disparity. And Gregor has played a leading role in that particular NHGRI cross consortium project. Finally, I'm almost done um, developing genomics practice recommendations. We think a lot about how to integrate much of what we're doing in the diagnostic lab, and we also think about how critical clinical laboratories are in terms of their, the genomic data that they're generating, the genomic data that they're analyzing. And if you look at the source of ClinVar submissions, you see that clinical labs actually are responsible for a bulk of that. And so we've put together a consortium-wide paper um, detailing considerations for reporting variants in novel candidate genes identified during clinical genomic testing, recognizing that that bottle, bo body of clinical laboratory data um, are, are absolutely teeming with candidate discoveries, and we've got to get those shared in a way that they can be further investigated. So I hope I've shown you that Gregor is now hitting its stride. Um, I have here the three, three goals that we focused in on today. The data set with broad utility, we have a data model, we have a harmonized data set, we've aggravated, aggregated our data, um, and it is being analyzed in aggregate now with early success stories already. We want to continue to increase the diagnostic yield. Many, many examples of molecular diagnoses that have been achieved through, through Gregor. We're implementing novel technologies, multiple technologies in many cases per family to try to understand how we can increase the diagnostic rate further. And we're developing new analysis tools. And then the genomics recommendations, you saw the recommendations for diagnostic laboratories. And a, a next goal will be really recommendations related to implementation of these new technologies in clinical labs. Looking to the future, we know that newer technologies have increased diagnostic yield, but only incrementally. There has been a drop off in gene discovery, a flattening of the increase in molecular diagnostic rates, and this suggests that more work is needed to be done. I would propose to you that the economy of scale that's achievable and has been already achieved by the Gregor Consortium supports the investigation of multiple technologies, multiple tools across a large rare disease set in a way that would be very difficult for individual collaborate, individual researchers to do in isolation. And we know that advancing application of genomic technologies and tools in clinical practice is gonna be critical. And finally, our vision. There are thousands more genes to discover, thousands more molecular mechanisms to uncover, I would propose. Um, continued and even increased engagement with other rare disease groups, particularly those who lack the variety of technologies and approaches studied in Gregor, is going to be very important. We also have a focus on engagement of underrepresented populations at multiple levels, targeted recruitment, the prioritiz prioritizing investigation of VUS that, that contribute to the VUS disparity, and of course, engagement of worldwide clinicians and researchers. We're working on innovative data sharing. I showed you a bit of that today, including the open access to our gene level Gregor data set. Variant level matching, federation are also critical. And pushing forward the leading edge of new technology and clinical implementation. And on that note, I will um, thank all of the um, leadership, including the NHGRI leadership that have worked very closely with our center, our data coordinating center, our research centers, and the many, many um, slide contributors for today's presentation. This is our group from last September's in-person meeting in St. Louis. We're an absolutely fabulous group, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you very much. And it was so good to see that um, much less different VUS rates after you really pounded on that. that that's really good to see. Um, but I'm wondering if you've got any sense yet in the rare disease space at what your upper bound is. Because I, mm. these won't all be genetic cause diseases. They, they, they meet all the criteria for, for having a genetic cause. They won't all turn out to be about the genetics. And what, you know, where, so is that gonna be 10% that we don't solve with genetics? Do you think it'll be 30%? That, I mean, we, we're all struggling mm. with that question in ways, other ways that we might get to that piece of it in, in, with different routes of, you know, um, you know, when, when ought we to be thinking about prenatal virus exposures or toxins mm. or things like that for, for some of these rare disease conditions? Yeah. And, how, you know, how do we, when do we declare victory and when do we let it go? Um, I, I think we're far from declaring victory for sure, but your question is a really good one. And I think that there are increasingly going to be a number of um, sort of, I guess you could call them edge cases where it's not a single variant, a single gene, high penetrant, and, and it's super straightforward and we're done. But I think that there is still a fair amount of lack of knowledge around a lot of the multi-locus effects. Um, admittedly, that's in a particular interest of mine, but understanding how combinations of rare variants at different loci influence phenotypes and they may not be even ultra rare variants, but they might be rare variants. Well, they, they'll be the tail end of polygenicity. Right. That is just bad luck from the right. polygenic end of things. Right, so, right. Or, and so kind of, kind of building, building up to that, then definitely the combination of rare and common variants. Yeah. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the polygenic risk. And how do we think about that? and best interpret that in the context of a person's environmental exposures. And I think the ideal setting is that we do all of that, you know, for, for, for each family. Um, we have a lot to learn, and I think the environmental investigations are definitely lagging. Um, we do occasionally talk a bit about that. It hasn't been a, maybe a stated focus of the, of the consortium, but we know of concrete examples, particularly for prenatal exposures, where that's um, very much influential, uh, influential on, on disease. There are really interesting examples, though, that you can see in clinic, and each of these is an N of 1, um, where maybe someone had a very difficult birth, a kind of a tra brain trauma during birth, developmental delay. They come to you, in, in this case, come to me when they're an adult. We do an exome sequence as a little bit of a, like, just in case, and in fact, find a very clear monogenic condition. And everyone wrote the person off because they said, well, you had this bad event during your you know, birth. And so obviously it's that. And that made a lot of sense until we knew better. Yeah. And so in terms of when do you kind of give it up and say we're done, I'm not even sure I can answer that because I would have told you I expected that person's testing to be negative. And also kudos on, the, on getting some public stuff out full public information that people can just be looking up. I think that's a great additional um, thing there. So really, yeah. congratulations on, on that kind of engagement with the public. Thank you. We've struggled with the fact that we know that there's an activation energy to getting dbGaP access and going into that data set. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if you are a researcher or a clinician who has not already taken those steps, your first question might be, is it worth my time? Is it worth my effort? And so being able to put out there as much as we can share at a you know, gene or variant level so that at least someone can go, is there even anything in there I want to look at more, we, we hope is going to be incredibly helpful. Joe Beery. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, th first, um, thank you for a really amazing presentation. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so not really a question, more of a, a comment and acknowledgement of the incredible um, capabilities and how far you've come. Um, I'm not sure if you know this or remember, but uh, I had um, Richard Gibbs and Jim Lepsky in 2011 were the first ones to sequence my twins. 
and the amount of care and what it took to get there um, has significantly changed our lives. So from a personal perspective, amazing progress. What you can do now with Gregor is just helping so many families. And as a personal you know, experience with what we've gone through and what you guys have done has just been remarkable. So you are definitely achieving the vision that was established back in 2011 when this was still unclear whether this was going to create any positive outcomes. So congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you for that comment. I, I have to say, I think it's the families like like yours um, that, you know, really keep us going even when, when things get pretty tough and even when, you know, advances in the field become increasingly challenging. So I appreciate that feedback and I'll definitely pass that on to the rest of our consortium. Judy. A lovely presentation, thank you. Um, I was surprised by the fraction of genes, like two th well over 2,000, where you had different results depending upon the reference sequence. Can you expand on that, 19 versus 38, going in both directions, and would that affect your, are there any plans to go for T2T mapping? So, so T2T was actually included in that as well. Um, you know, I had a more detailed slide that I took out that went into that. I was afraid I was going to go over time, which I think I did. Um, but the, the paper itself is available on, um, I think it's MedArchive, and I, I could share that with you. The work was led by two fabulous graduate students at our Stanford site. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I can just say they, I mean, we, we were blown away by this as well. Yeah. Well, was one better than the other? Or does this go both um, ways? It, it went both ways, that for Got sure. It. Yeah, there was, not, there was not a clear winner. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nancy already touched on this, but I wanted to further commend you guys on the data sharing approach. I think that's really critical. Um, I was looking at the website. I mean, having very easy access stuff is super critical, and keep yeah. on doing that. That's great. Having the software available is really critical. I was able to pull many things while we were sitting here and sharing with you. That was awesome. Um, and I also really appreciate a lot of details of what you actually get through the dbGaP site so you can go beyond and understand what the DABL models are. I just I think you guys are doing a great job with that, and I want you to encourage you guys to keep it up. Thank you. So Jennifer, I have tremendous respect for what you're, the consortium is doing. I, I just want to get some clarity that might be valuable. I'm hearing you use words like undiagnosed. I'm hearing you use words like, um, well, you know, um, that are more clinical in nature. Can you just crisply tell people what is the difference between Gregor's lane and the UDN, Undiagnosed Diseases Network lane? Because it seemed like some of the things you're talking about start to overlap the kind of things that at least I think the UDN and the UDP are doing. So I think that, um, for, first of all, with the, the Gregor Consortium, that's a, it's a really good question. I, I should have made that more clear in the talk, actually. Um, what the Gregor Consortium is really seeking to do, we are studying individual rare disease families who don't have a molecular diagnosis. That, that piece is true. We're doing it at a much larger scale per site and per center. And our goal is not simply for those families to get a molecular diagnosis, the ones that come from our program, but for us to be able to generate discoveries that improve molecular diagnoses across the rare disease field. So we're hoping to have a much greater breadth of reach. Some of that comes with understanding how do we use these different technologies. What are the variant functional impacts that we're identifying, both within our consortium and when we can partner with others who have rare variants in the same gene as well? So I think that our, our approach in many ways is not solely focused on, on studying the rare disease families that come through the program, but doing this at a much higher scale. We don't do all of the, um, we don't have as, as much of a focus on in-person phenotyping that the Undiagnosed Disease Network do, although we do deep phenotyping, we rely on our clinical collaborators, but doing this in a way that we can really advance the field as a whole, not just the families that happen to come through our study. Do you think both programs are needed? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm asked this question. So, I mean, so I'm this, asked this question. I mean, and, and the more, I'm just telling you, the more I hear Gregor sounding clinical, 
And the more I'm asked, well, why, is, why do we have UDN if we have Gregor? I mean, I've been explicitly asked this question. So I just want to understand the two lanes. Yeah. So my answer is going to be colored by the fact that my chair is one of the UDN PIs. <laughs> he might be listening right now. I, I think that, um, I, you know, we, so it's a good question. So I can comment at least at Baylor, we have had a very small number of patients who've actually happened to go through both programs. I'm a um, clinician for the Baylor UDN. I see some of the adult patients. And um, Jill Mokri, who really runs our, our UDN at Baylor, attends our Gregor meetings. We actually intentionally have a lot of overlap. For one thing, someone's got, getting a gene discovery over here. We should, we should share that, right? We can share it locally as well as, well as more broadly. Um, in the times that I think that the, the UDN has been really helpful has been a patient where there's some additional expert clinician expertise and phenotyping that needed to happen that we could specifically do at our clinical site that maybe that patient didn't otherwise have access to. Now that's something that Gregor, um, we, we don't do that type, we're not flying patients in and doing a special kind of MRI, so we're not doing that level of in-person phenotyping and we haven't assembled that level of clinical experts, although we pull them in when we need them. But I think in that case, there are very concrete examples where the UDN can be very helpful for that phenotyping and for getting the cardiologist, pulmonologist, gastroenterologist, ophthalmologist in a room together with the geneticist. So it's a different model in that sense. It's much more um, high touch and, and effort intensive per family. And so I am biased. I like the efficiency of, of discovery and moving things forward that we do in, in Gregor, but I definitely see where the UDN for specific cases can be a really, really great model. And, and we have not had any trouble having a family come through both for exactly that reason. Yeah. So Brendan, if you're listening. Um, so as a clinician, I have to make the case for phenotyping, how critical it is in these families. And um, so my questions are related along those lines. In your common data model, how do you represent phenotypes? Um, in, our, in our data model? Right. They're by human phenotype ontology. HBO yeah, terms. absolutely. And, and um, I didn't show any of that, that work today, but we proactively use human phenotype ontology data, right. and we do a lot of computational analyses with that. And that means that we really, really insist that our clin clinical collaborators send us as detailed of phenotype information as possible because um, you know, macrocephaly as, as the lone phenotype is not helpful to anybody yeah. once you're down the road staring down a potential discovery. We try to get as much of that as up, up front as possible, although we have the ability to go back to families and get updated information, especially for the young ones who might have phenotypic evolution. And so would you, I think again, raising what Eric was hinting at, would you at some point recall by genotype a uh, family member or even the pro, pro band? We do that all the time. We, um, we don't recall them back like to, to come to us in person. In fact, I would say a predominance of our, we do, have, we do have local patients, but a predominance of our patients are actually not from the Houston area. So when we're calling them back, we're often contacting with their permission, their clinicians as well, and saying, hey, we've got three cases. They have a similar variance in this gene. The other two have macrocephaly. Can you measure a head circumference? Or is there any way you can get that brain MRI because we're seeing some structural changes? And as much as we like those data on the front end, there are times that you identify kind of phenotypes on the back end that you wouldn't have thought to ask about when you first enrolled them. So we absolutely, as we're um, developing kind of discoveries um, have have a process for going back to families. And then yeah. lastly, what is what do you think about global data sharing in this setting? You had matchmaker exchange, but that's such a huge potential. You know, if you're a family in Japan that has the same clustering of phenotypes, how do you foresee that in, within Gregor? Oh, we love it. So a, a lot of our, um, I think it's tremendously important, and that's one reason why candidate genes and variants, um, it's part of the Gregor policy that those are shared through one of the nodes of the matchmaker exchange for that very reason. There are, with some of these rare diseases, we might have in our entire consortium only one or two families. And so the only way that you're really gonna solidify a new discovery is by identifying families elsewhere that have the same condition. 
And of course, it's also very important to begin to understand that there may be different populations where a disease is expressed somewhat differently. And so having that full range of phenotypic information is critical. The way that that plays out is that a lot of our papers are collaborative, and they're collaborative with clinicians and scientists in other countries. Yeah. Thank you. Casey. Thank, thank you. So um, I had a question about, uh, so you mentioned trying to reach the VUS, uh, uh, the groups that are have more, more VUSs. And um, are these new programs that you're proposing in terms of reach where you're um, uh, overcoming barriers around insurance? And are those, ha have those been effective to reach these populations uh, that you're seeking? OK, yeah. Um, I can think of a couple of different ways to answer that. There was the sort of more like, like larger VUS study using the multiplexed assays of variant effects. But I think you're thinking more at an individual family level, going into clinics where there are underserved populations. Um, I would say most, if not all, of our centers have local clinics that are dedicated to those populations. Um, and for many of us where there's already genetic clinicians seeing these patients. And so it's very easy for us to embed in those clinics. And if there is a family that is undiagnosed, to bring them into Gregor. There are some creative ways that we think about, like often the family hasn't had any genetic testing and maybe they have something that's actually well known. And so do they, do they kind of need Gregor? Maybe not, but do they need testing? Yes. And so a lot of our sites have different projects that are sort of, um, pre-Gregor, where you can get the f help get the family some amount of testing first to rule out most likely conditions. And then if they remain undiagnosed, now they're, they're really able to be enrolled into Gregor. Okay. Um, the reason for that is solely that our focus um, has really been on families who are undiagnosed by exome. But the problem is that a lot of families, both locally and also internationally, don't have access to exomes. And so we've We've developed some different creative ways to get them the exome if that's the next best step. It may not always be. Um, and then bring them fully into the program if that's negative. Yeah. So, so how do people typically get into the program? A few different ways. Um, and each, I guess I would say each research center is maybe a little bit different in this, but very broadly speaking, there are a lot of patients that will learn about us and reach out directly. They can go to our website. They um, they can um, kind of email the consortium as a whole and, and ask questions. Similarly, a researcher or a clinician could email the consortium as a whole, and then our coordinating center will sort of share these emails and we'll figure out which is the site, the research center that makes the most sense. Um, we also do a lot of engagement of our local clinicians at our, at our different sites, so that I would say all, all of the geneticists at Texas Children's and Baylor know about our study, and so they'll just contact us when they have a patient who might be appropriate. And um, when it works very smoothly, they'll contact us before the patient comes in for the next clinic visit, and we can even kind of go there, work with them on consenting, answer questions, get samples, and things like that. But we also have a lot of international collaborators, and those are a little bit harder to establish sometimes. Um, what has worked the best is to have some face-to-face -face time. And so when we have putative collaborators, especially clinicians from other countries who are really interested in working with us, will try to the extent possible to get to where they are, visit their clinics, get to know them, sometimes bring over some of their trainees to work with us for a couple of months, really build up trust, and then work with them on best practices or best ways for them to get families enrolled, despite the fact that most of them are sort of spending 200% of their time seeing patients. They don't really have time to like engage in research, and so that's kind of an additional challenge. Um, and so with each one of those examples, it kind of works out a little bit differently, what works well for them. But we're very, very flexible um, in accepting rare disease families, regardless of where they come from or what prior testing they've had. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm learning uh, about your program, so thanks for sharing that, those details. Absolutely. Okay, Jennifer, thank you for making the trip. We appreciate you being here in person. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, in November of 2023, NHGRI sponsored